We're good. How are you doing? How are you? Hey, good. Good to see you. Gang's back together again. <laughs> Um, can we rotate the questions stuff like this? Stuff and always start. I'll, I'll switch to that. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be the first on that all the time. I'll make sure that This, this, um, let's move it here. We'll go here. It's better I here than it should be fine if we put it right in the middle. Okay. And we have the speaker facing that way. Okay. There we go. It should be fine. We're right. right here. Anyways, I'm Laura Rodriguez. I'm the executive director of Lakeland 
vision, um, which is the community citizen-driven visioning organization representing the voice of people who call Lakeland home for the last 25 years. Um, we're happy to partner again with, um, with Lakeland now to bring this opportunity for citizen engagement on goals within our citizens vision. And based upon the healthcare goal that you, the community, set, we want to know, is Lakeland, in fact, a community promoting healthy lifestyles and prevention while providing access to quality health care for people of all ages and all income levels. Um, so tonight, we not only look forward to this important dialogue um, on health care in Lakeland, but we are also continuing Lakeland Vision's foundational mission for to seek citizen input. So I encourage you to participate in the question and answer portion of this um, of this um, panel. And also, I just want to point out that we would love for you to provide your feedback through a very short survey that you can find <coughs> in your program um, this evening as we close. Um, and also, I would just really like to thank Labor Vision board members um, that work directly on this um, forum tonight, Trinity Lorino and Alice Kohler, um, two of Labor Vision board members who just worked tirelessly to bring this here tonight. And um, also, I'd like to recognize the Labor Vision board members that are audience. don't want to miss anybody, so if you could just please bring your hand if you're a Lakeland Vision. There we got a few. And um, also, I just um, want to pass it over to um, Alice Kohler, who is going to be our esteemed moderator this evening. She is also the CEO of Lakeland Volunteers in Medicine. Um, just being able to, to keep up with the demand 
uh, and make sure that we are still providing a level of access for our, our current residents and those residents that come in and recruiting those quality providers to Lakeland um, continues to be our struggle. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump to Dr. Hay just because he's with a direct service provider and Joy's organization is a little bit different. So Dr. Hay, next. Well, sure. Some of the priorities that we're looking at and challenges and barriers gets to the, the list that we're sort of well aware of is that right now, folks have to, they're really busy, they're under a lot of stress, and just finding time for your own health care. So that's one of the access issues, is raising folks' awareness on how important their health is, especially when they're taking care of their family. Second is then getting that access, the transportation, the cost, navigating, and, and also just finding the time to, to take care of your own health. There could even be a fear or, or a trust issue too, so that getting over that is extremely important. So the way our organization is approaching it is looking at access to care uh, first starts with first educating, educating and health promoting. Uh, we're going out to barber shops and we're talking to the barbers and their customers about men's health and screening for silent issues like blood pressure, they didn't know they had high blood pressure, high sugar, they didn't know they had high sugar. But now what do you do with that information? And then it's the programs that are available in our county that get you to your primary care provider. On our end at Lakeland Regional, we've started a program where doctors who have now graduated medical school, they want to go into training in a specific area. So we've increased the number of people getting training in family medicine, internal medicine, and psychiatry. And so that will, you know, put a lot of emphasis on educating them on how to care for our young, our old, our, our active, our workers. And so we hope to uh, raise that up to where they're going to be in our community and be a part of our community. Thank you. Hi, so we're a little unique and different from the rest here, um, service providers. Um, as part of the government arm, the county <coughs> government structure, um, I think overall, even as, with healthcare aside, the vast explosion of population growth in Polk County has created a number of challenges um, across the board. Um, when it comes to healthcare though, it's an ever evolving, uh, changing environment post COVID. We've got a lot of things that are um, coming down from the state, coming down from the federal government, uh, not only in the form of policy, in the form of funding, um, different funding comes with different rules and restrictions attached to that. So we're constantly trying to keep our finger on the pulse of those policy level changes that will impact the way we fund um, our local health care safety net here in the county. Um, a large part of what we do is fund our nonprofit um, and even private um, health care providers to serve our target population, those people who fall through the cracks, who are uninsured, low income. And so, as Dr. Hayden mentioned, we're competing, healthcare's competing with their other basic needs, is what we're finding. And with the constant changes in the population, we've got a lot of newer people here in Polk County that were here. Um, you know, with Polk being the fastest growing county in the state, fifth in the nation, we're the largest in terms of domestic migration last year alone. So you've got a lot of new um, residents that are just trying to figure out you know, the resources, and it can be very difficult to navigate. I would have to say the population growth, navigating the, and, and Polk is very fortunate because we've got a whole lot more than a lot of our other surrounding counties do, and it's just how does that all come together? How do we make this easy for the community to access those resources? So um, helping them to remember, you know, that their own health is important and that moving that up on the list of priorities um, has been an ongoing challenge, but some of what we're doing is we are working more on outreach, getting the word out. We're doing some things different that we've never done before. <laughs> we're taking a lot of risks um, and trying these things, and so now's the time to do that. Because we can't. We have to continue to adapt to the change around us. If we continue to stay stagnant, we will not be able to meet the those changing needs in the community. So. Um, we're, I'm excited about the opportunities of what we're doing because we're able to do that from this local program that's not a state-sponsored or a federal-sponsored program. So um, there's a lot happening on that front. But I'd have to say that population um, and the importance of health care is the biggest um, challenge that we're seeing. Great. Thank you. 
Um, next question is, um, according to the Florida Health Justice Project, since the end of Medicaid continuous coverage provision of March of 2023, uh, nearly one million Floridians lost their Medicaid coverage. So my question to the panel is, how has this affected your organization, if at all, um, and how are you navigating that particular challenge? Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Hay. So you can imagine having a light at the end of the tunnel and being able to access health care when Medicaid was expanded. Now with that going away, folks that were starting to get engaged in health care screenings, understanding that there were preventable things that they start early, they might have had someone for the first time sit down with them and listen to them very carefully about their family history their dietary habits, their living situations, and these social determinants of health, these other things that impact and stress a person. And they were able to get into a healthcare home that got to know them. And to have that go away, not only do you start to lose those preventative efforts that they were starting on, screening for sugar problems, screening for colon cancer. When a problem brand new starts, now they have a much harder time accessing a healthcare environment. So that loss of, of Medicaid, and, and we hope that that certainly uh, the, the minds that are you know working on this to try to make an improvement can start to address that. So a major concern over over folks finding that they have that access and can get into that healthcare home. Awesome, thank you. Um, moving forward um, and piggybacking on this loss of care through through Medicaid. Um, during the last census, which was 2020, so take this approach with a grain of salt, um, there were an estimated nearly 50,000 uninsured adults <coughs> in Polk County who also lived below 200% of the federal poverty level. That was a lot of numbers. Um, what I mean by take that with a grain of salt is a lot has changed in Polk County since 2020. So those numbers are likely conservative. I don't know that there are accurate updated um, numbers. With that in mind, I would like to talk about how each of our individual organizations are, are meeting the needs of the uninsured in our community. With all of her <laughs> joy at Johnson, so. <laughs> <laughs> so she's helping us out amazing. Yes. Um, to piggyback on uh, my comments previously, we are expanding access and trying to help connect people. Um, it's very confusing when you're covered for a short while, then you're not covered, then this program's available, now it's not available. Um, when, you're, when you actually have the uh, ability or, I guess, courage to step up and seek out care, the last thing you want to do is be run through the mill and transferred and put on hold or speak to an automated system. Um, so we understand that it can be very challenging and we've got a lot of work to do still because of all the resources, but we have been looking at our local um, a program that is uh, funded by half cent sales tax and so we have increased our income limits one is one of the things we've done again with inflation the rising cost of everything the minimum wage increases it's very interesting to see people who you would who normally would not be considered low income or in poverty while they may be making more it's also they're paying more to just live and survive right so by virtue of that they truly could benefit from having access to health care coverage um, we are actually able to get people signed up for the full health care plan, um, which offers a lot of resources. It's very comprehensive. They have access to primary care, a wide range of specialty care services through our network. And it's not just, um, you know, a clinic setting. It's private practices. They get to choose their medical home. Um, we, we will pay those claims for them. We have negotiated rates with our providers. It is really a, a good program to have for the community. That we do more than just that. Um, not only can we get them covered, um, we've added benefits and services to the program in addition to um, increasing the income limit. So we're covering things that we would not cover before, um, such as durable medical equipment or certain knee joint replacement surgeries or things that were considered very high costly in the past, but now we're in a position to take some of those risks. Um, a couple of other things we're doing is we're partnering with um, other entities to get the word out, to have more navigators in the community. Um, we have a lot of community partners, um, Central Florida Healthcare and Lakeland Regional and LVIM being one, or uh, three of those actually. But we're using um, all resources we can to get the word out to the community to reach people where they are. 
Um, and different organizations have different networks and relationships, so we're relying on them. Um, we just recently moved forward with um, a, an agreement and a contract with Lakeland Regional to have navigators at their different facilities. Um, we are also working with United Way. Um, we're working with the Family Health Care Foundation. So we are expanding our reach. We're looking at our website. We're going to have a new website launch that will be more user friendly. We've got an electronic portal. Um, we've got a mobile unit that goes out to people in the community. And we also have other grants um, and other projects that we fund outside of our um, Polk Health Care Plan to have a number of ways to offer uh, health care in the community and it doesn't all just have to be one size fits all because we know that that really is not the case. So um, there's a lot of access points and I could talk all day but I'm going to turn over the mic. <laughs> Thank you Joy. We really know all of us here at one room we probably go stay online but we're not going to. Um, my next question I'm going to start with Jason. Um, according to the 2022 Community Health Assessment update, 24% of Polk County adults nearly one in four, <coughs> as compared to 18% statewide and 15% nationwide report living in poor to fair health. Why do you think this is, and how does your organization address this? I think a lot of what Dr. Hayes said is exactly right, is that you know the preventativeness, we, we, we wait until there's a catastrophe uh, in order to then go seek health care. And, and once you've um, passed that, that precipice, it becomes way more difficult and, and, and uh, to, to recover, number one, and then to potentially live with the outcomes of that. And so, um, you know, I'm excited about uh, Lakeland Regional's um, uh, building of our primary care base because I truly believe it, it starts with the tip of that spear and really getting people engaged and partnering with their health care. I believe that health care done right is a relationship uh, done between a provider and their patient. And so we are heavily trying to ensure that we have enough capacity in our primary care um, in order to, to meet those patients. Um, education, uh, we're trying to, to get creative with our hours, we're trying to ensure that um, you know there's no barriers to our primary care. We, we've uh, started, you know, when we, when we began to look at the amount of people that were coming through our urgent care and, and really using our urgent care as their primary care because they didn't establish anywhere and it was just for those acute needs. Um, we, we really looked at some of the unused capacity of our entire primary care panel uh, and really started to identify through what we call our fast access, but it's same day and next day appointments with a primary care provider in the hopes that once they meet that provider, they can have more of that relationship and not that acute transaction that an urgent care tends to provide in order to hopefully establish with that patient, or establish with that provider, and, and then really begin to work on those underlying issues those underlying concerns in order um, to, to take a proactive approach to their own health care. Great. Thank you. Dr. Hay? Now, I wanted to point out something sort of hidden in that question. It said 24% of, of adults feel that they are living in poor or fair health. That means, if I got my math correct, 76% think they're living in good or excellent health. And the data does not support that. <laughs> this is one of our problems. We have to raise awareness, but then we have to empower people. And if you are wanting to seek health care and find out about this, you have to stand up and make sure you've got the best clinicians. And we've got you know, good representations here of clinics and folks that you want to connect with. Unfortunately, obesity, high blood pressure, the number of strokes, the health disparities in our minority groups are unacceptable. But look what happens. You ask generally how people are feeling. This is optimistic, and I think it's, it's not, not really reality. So we have to help, help in that area. So to be clear, you're saying that people are worse off than this data states. Absolutely. <laughs> um, anybody else want to comment on that? Scenario. So I'll just comment real quick um, just to share that um, Central Florida Healthcare, of course, we see a lot of the uh, patient population that has nowhere else to go. And so we don't turn anybody away. So we deal with the patient population that sometimes comes to us as a last resort or, um, you know, they have a lot of health issues. So what we try to do because we're a joint commission um, accredited as a patient centered medical home is have that ability to try to reach out to those patients and see them as soon as possible so that they're not coming to us with a lot of chronic 
conditions, which is very, very challenging. Um, Joy talked a little bit about navigators, and we have navigators at all of our health centers. And so they play a big role, whether they're with Center for Healthcare or they're through the United Way or wherever um, those navigators are, they are so valuable um, to our community because they can really reach out and talk to those um, patients and talk to those individuals, and they do a really good job. Um, you know, a lot of them are very um, you know, diverse and they speak, you know, they're bilingual, and so that really helps, I think, the you know, comfort uh, for the patient population. So I just want to add that, that we do try to reach out, try to help them before things get too, you know, too chronic. Where do we want to go from here? Um, let's talk about behavioral health a little bit. Um, through the community health needs assessment process, behavioral health has been identified as a top health care priority for Polk County. However, in Polk County, at uh, last <coughs> count, there were 960 patients to one mental health provider as compared to 550 to one in the state. How can we, as health care providers, work together to improve mental health in our community? Right, okay, so <laughs> I think first of all, when we think of mental health, it ha just has to be better integrated into medical care. A, a person with diabetes is just not a diabetic. They're a person with many other issues. And you know, we talk about they could be having issues with high blood pressure, but they may be under certain stress. Unemployment, may be under family stress, but there may be some behavioral health issues. They may be having depression. Not to say diabetes causes depression, but you can. And if you're depressed, the chances that you're checking your sugar, that you're following your diet, declines and, and the diabetes can get worse. So we need to have uh, start to increase the folks that can talk to patients and have it under the same roof as your primary care provider. So your primary care provider is providing your medical care but then there's somebody there for those ups and downs, somebody you can talk to to get through if you're feeling a little down, feeling that there's some other issues, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress. So those being connected together is one of the emphasis we're doing, but also a big part of Lakeland Regional is to bring on not only training doctors who want to be psychiatrists, and we'll soon, at the, at the end of the next few cycles, we'll be having up to 16 doctors training to be psychiatrists but also it's mental health social workers. It's also those who are psychologists and needing to do internships. We just opened a 96 bed, of uh, the Harold Family uh, Center for Wellness and Mental Health is a place where we can do this training. That is huge because we, we really have to introduce the, the community to the help that's available and it can be tailored to their own personal needs. Um, I'll just add that um, I think we've got to focus on the long-term systemic changes um, that are needed to continue to um, combat those challenges. Again, with a growing population, you don't have enough providers. Um, focusing on the, the pipeline opportunities for the behavioral health career pathways, um, looking at our local high schools, working with our colleges, uh, certification programs, and really garnering the interest um, of people getting um, into that career. Um, I think that is a good s step in the right direction. I think that all the things that are happening with the uh, residency program is great. Um, and there's so much more that we can do. Um, I will say that for the county, one of the things we've done to try to help increase access um, on behavioral health is we have um, you know, used our, our body of government to lobby um, at the state and national level. Um, both on policy change as well as funding opportunities to help us do some things that are creative and innovative, um, to be a seed planter, to initiate um, a one-time infusion of funds to try some things such as um, investing in peer specialist certification programs and training for those people who might cycle in and out of the criminal justice system um, who may want to use their experience to help others. Um, bringing those um, opportunities to the forefront and you know piloting them and see what works what doesn't work um, really getting the word out about working in our schools and trying to understand all the different changing dynamics when it comes to the different mental health 
programs and funding that they have, right? So there's, we're using, we were able to actually get dollars, um, and we, we've got those in place, they're implemented <coughs> right now, um, to roll those programs out, and it hasn't quite been six months yet, but we're looking forward to see the results of those things. Um, additionally, we've used our um, position to lobby on behalf of some of our behavioral health providers in the community to be able to participate in uh, revenue maximization strategies to get more money from the federal government to help them for their uncompensated care. So we, I feel like we are doing um, under the county anything and everything under the sun that we can do um, outside of the norm of our typical um, administration of these sales tax funds. But it's been a lot of work going into it and we're hoping to see a lot of good results from it. And we'll also learn from the things that don't work as well. Thank you, Jay. Jason. I was just going to say that Watson's going to try and hire all 16 of Dr. Jason's <laughs> <laughs> providers that come out. Uh, uh, I mean, we have we have multiple slots open in psychiatry, psychology, behavioral health at the clinic that we're trying to fill. I think, to Dr. Gray's point, the, the outcry that I hear the most is actually from my primary care providers, um, that they are, they are practicing a, a specialty in which they're not comfortable with, but they, there's nowhere else. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's a huge need and, and I think the idea that we are uh, desperately looking at is how, how can we integrate uh, in that, that facility where they're at to be able to have that clean handoff and know that that patient is then going to be listened to and taken care of um, when, when the primary care uh, is able to identify that depression or those sort of things and say, hey, I really got somebody I want you to talk to. But, you know, that is the... You know, not only from the statistics and the patient, but I hear it every day from my primary care docs that we have to work on a solution better uh, here because I'm I'm waiting in the waters that I'm not I'm not trained to wait in. To be completely honest. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll add real quick too. Um, you know, when I started in this role, you know, several years ago, uh, we didn't do behavioral health. We referred it out. But I think you know, from listening to all of us, we all own that uh, for behavioral health because that's part of you know, what we're, we're helping the patient with. And so we do partner with Tri-County Human Services. They have counselors in um, our health centers, and Peace River does as well. So having those partners so we can do that warm handoff, I think is very um, important. And then we also, a few years ago, hired a director <coughs> of behavioral health. And so we have a team um, in our winter payment office that um, sees patients for behavioral health. And then we also have a practitioner in there so it's integrated in both our Winter Haven location and our Lakeland location. And, Ellis, it, and then I think really this question to put back out to the audience and those listening is there's what can you do? There is a, there is a thing called, we, we've all heard of first aid. You know, first aid is something you can train. It's not that you're going to be a doctor or nurse, but you can provide first aid. Well, there's mental health first aid. Find out where this is available. It is a very helpful, important. It helps soccer coaches, teachers, and workers in an, in an office setting. When you take a first aid course, and this is mental health first aid, both for adults and children, you help to recognize who's in trouble by not being judgmental, by asking the right questions, by just being there. A person who's depressed and not seeing where to turn, just having somebody else say, hey, I, I noticed things were a little different. Is there anything I can help out with? And typically the answer will be, no, I'm fine. That's okay. If you ever need anything, let me know. It tells that person somebody cared. Mental health first aid teaches how to do that comfortably. Know the signs of suicide. Know how to ask about those signs. So you can help a person in a crisis. So I really encourage mental health first aid answers this question. Because you've seen the clinical approach that we're doing on the medical side. The community can be approaching this from the, your side in getting this training. And it is offered in various places. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, yeah. A, just a quick follow-up to that. You can hear me, right? Um, one of the initiatives that we were able to get um, grant dollars for um, from our advocacy efforts is to roll out teen mental health first aid, um, working to train more teen mental health first aid trainers out in the community. So we're excited about that, kind of piggybacking on what we've learned for the adult mental health first aid, the youth. But there's that segment, right? Our, the teen population, they generally learn from their peers. So what better opportunity than to offer some training to get more of us uh, prepared and equipped with the tools to help those that are going through a lot of life challenges. Yeah. 
Great, thank you. <coughs> We're gonna shift gears a little bit uh, and talk a little bit about immigration and how it's affected our local health care. So the question is, uh, where am I? In July 2023, Florida enacted legislation that requires hospitals to ask patients their immigration status. What have your organizations observed? Um, what have your challenges been and responses to this legislation been? Or how, if at all, is it impacting your, your organization's ability to provide health care? I'm going to start with Dr. Gates since you're representing the hospital. Whenever there's an emergent, whenever there's an emergent medical condition, we take care of the person regardless, regardless of economic status, uh, social status, immigration status. We're there to take care of people in emergent situations, and that, that's, that's the bottom line. We want all patients to feel safe in obtaining health care. And rest assured, knowing that their private medical information is remaining private. I, I think the response to this is that at the time of registration, along with all the other questions of address and other information that's gathered, this question is asked, and the answer can be, uh, I decline to answer. And as a total, this is summed up without identifying information and reported to the state. So I hope that clarifies to me, I mean, this is something that I'm, I've learned about, you know, I'm glad, glad this question came up, is so that in general, the numbers are just reported in, in total. Um, and the question is asked, but the person can decline the question, and we're there to take care of you. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line, so I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Does anyone else have something to add on that, Fred? Anything? Well, I'll just add, um, we're not a hospital, so we you know, follow a little bit differently, and we do see a lot of the migrant population, and so we, I guess I will say that we're, we're fortunate because we don't, we don't have to ask that question, and we can just treat um, every patient that comes through the door, so that's that's a, a plus for us. You're nodding your head as well, Yeah, I mean, although a variety of our specialists work in the hospital, right? The, the, the front desk checks them in, and, and by the time they get to us, we just we take care of them. The vast majority of our work is in our 19 different outpatient locations, so which I can, that's not something that we're regulated to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. All right, we're doing so good on time. This is so exciting. Uh, okay, next question. Um, I want to focus back in on your individual organizations and ask, other than the things that you've already mentioned, what advances has your organization made to expand the healthcare services that your organization provides? You know, when Joy was talking about the benefits of the half cent sales tax, um, that is a wonderful opportunity in Polk County. You know, we have health centers in Highlands and Hardy County, and we don't have that benefit. And so I will say that it does allow for us to see patients, it allows for us um, to expand um, for bricks and mortar, and so for different opportunities. So, what, you know, with our challenges and of course the things that we've already talked about. We've been able to add several health centers in Polk County, um, and so that's been a benefit, you know, trying to be able to keep up, you know, with the need is difficult, we've all acknowledged that. But just being able to try to be very proactive and add new um, health centers, and also um, we've been very proactive to look at um, hiring specialty care. So we recently hired an endocrinologist for our diabetic um, population, we're bringing in a rheumatologist, uh, we have a podiatrist, we're providing optometry services. So just looking at those um, opportunities when our patients are challenged, if they're referred out, um, and maybe you know, our patient who's referred to, they don't accept the, the um, coverage that they have. Um, so just being able to be proactive and adding specialty services in addition to looking for all of those opportunities to add new um, buildings to be able to continue to take care of our patient population. So uh, again, we know there's a demand that we're just trying to fill. We've added uh, since 2020, you know, 40 different specialists um, to, to continue to grow there. Um, we've expanded into to Winter Haven. You know, what, what works well for the the Watson model obviously is, you know, if there's a if there's a demand and we have the capacity, that's where we try and go. So we've got orthopedics 
in the Winter Haven market. But for me, <clears throat> I, you know, the, the delivery of healthcare, the, the ability to access healthcare is so convoluted and so full of red tape uh, and, and so difficult. Um, and, and we're a big problem when it comes to that. It's hard to get a hold of us. It's hard to talk to our providers. It's hard to, you know, access that relationship that you want with your provider. And so over the past two years of my tenure, we really have a, a large focus on reducing the, the amount of red tape that it takes for our patients to access us. Um, we're kicking off a, an entirely new campaign in October relative to, you know, how can we make it easier for our patients to get a hold of us. I firmly believe that, you know, healthcare is truly bucketed into, you know, two different buckets. You have the transaction and then you have the relationship, right? And the transaction is, look, I just need my appointment, I just need my refill, I just need my meds, my whatever. And then, and then you have the relationship and the relationship is I'm scared, I have questions, you know, that sort of so much of our time on the phones and our doctors is on that transaction. And so we have got to be more efficient uh, when it comes to tra transactional, uh, you know, uh, so many industries have done that and healthcare has been very reticent to do it. I mean, my God, we still rely on faxes. I hate faxes. I like, no, don't need faxes anymore, but like, except healthcare, we fax all the time. And, and just call us, but we're terrible at the phones, right? Like I can't, I can't find people that want to talk on the phone anymore. They're, they're my son's age. And son hates to talk on the phone, but he'll send a text message. Right? He literally doesn't know how to talk on the phone. He answers and doesn't say anything. I'm like, hello? Whoa. <laughs> so, so we have got to be better at, at, at removing the, the, the red tape that it takes just to have those transactional things that then allows for our staff, our providers, our nurses, all the great people that want to take care of people to have the time to deal with those relationships. And so a lot of internal inefficiencies has, has been kind of my, my soapbox for, for a long time because, you know, we've done it the way we've always done it uh, for, for a number of years. And so um, that's something I'm very excited about in the next upcoming months uh, that, that we're, we're going we're gonna to get better, I promise. You heard it here. <laughs> Just kidding. Ready, Joe? Yep. So um, there's a few points I'd like to share um, on top of some of what I've already um, listed out. So some of what we're doing, again, we're not drug service providers. We um, administer, coordinate, use our um, organization and its uh, position to help our community and our stakeholders. Um, so we were able to do that. So our, our hospitals, right, um, they are also bearing the brunt of the increased growth. So we are fortunate because of our um, what we've learned before from previous opportunities um, that we participated in to maximize revenue um, for our nonprofits that offer a high numbers of charity care, um, we were able to pass some local policy that helps our hospitals um, get an assessment, and that assessment is sent up as a match, and they draw down additional federal dollars to help um, decrease the um, Medicaid gap. Um, generally, they're getting what about um, 60 cents on the dollar, right? This helps them get a little closer to more like 80 cents on the dollar. So it doesn't make them whole, but the additional funding it takes, the cost of care, I mean, we all know is expensive, and the more that we can do to help manage that here in our local community helps all of us because someone's gonna have to bear the brunt of that cost, right? So we're really excited. Um, we've been participating in that um, going into year three now, and now we're able to even somewhat double up on that and do even more. Um, and we'll be talking about that here in the next few months with our board. Um, in addition to that, we have some com um, community paramedics that work with our behavioral health program. Um, it's a jail transition program um, to keep people um, from being institutionalized that may have a mental health or substance use uh, issue or condition. And so what we're doing now and what we've learned from that program is we're expanding our community paramedicine outside of the criminal justice system and those that might cycle through it. And we're now, um, we've hired, I think, four more. So we've got a team of five and they are working now with our hospitals um, to reduce the um, readmission rates. They're looking at the 911 data and looking at those frequent uh, callers. Um, you know, we've got one person we saw that has called like, I don't know, 30 something times in a very, very short period of time. So trying to target those people who may not have connections, family, friends, um, awareness of the resources around them, and not just, they're not case managing, they've got the ability to do some on-scene 
um, immediate um, care for them and assessments. And they can follow up in ways that a case manager can't or that a law enforcement officer shouldn't, right? So we are excited to roll that out. Again, it's new. It's, there's a lot of things that are new that we're rolling out, but we haven't quite um, had a, enough time to start getting enough data to start sharing some of those results, but we do know it's going to help um, the community in a number of ways. Um, another thing that we've been doing is we've been funding a lot of healthcare infrastructure projects. And in the past, we typically would not do that. Um, but seeing the circumstances that we're in today post COVID, um, with the population, um, population means more sales tax revenue. Um, there's been more than anticipated <coughs> in recent years. So we are working to put that to use um, in the best ways that we can. So we've opened the door for funding some of those projects and in all honesty, it's truly an investment um, for us to be able to care for, to help our providers here, right, help the community. Um, and not just our target population, others are gonna benefit. We all could benefit from it by having more clinics, more clinicians, more access. So that's something new that we're doing and I can't say that we'll always do it, but for now we're able to be in a position um, to use the dollars in that way. Um, and that's what's helped um, fund some of the things that are um, rolling out from Lake Lincoln Regional and with Central Florida Healthcare and um, even with some of the free clinics, LVIM and many, many others. And there's more to come on that front. So, um, and then, because we have time, one more point. <laughs> um, we are also, like I mentioned, some of the behavioral health projects that we've uh, been, I could talk all day, but I won't. Um, we've increased our allocation for behavioral health um, spending again. Um, we can allocate funds all day long, but if you know a provider or a clinic group doesn't have a provider to see patients in a timely manner, they can't bill us for it. So um, we, we've increased it to about over $30 million um, just this year is how much money we have allocated for behavioral health services for our target population. Um, and that's from a multitude of funding sources. It's local dollars, state, federal funds, opioid settlement dollars. Um, so there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Um, to really help support the providers here, um, others that aren't here in the room, to be able to retain, recruit, um, have the capacity, because even though that, um, you know, we've got a, a high influx of changing demographics in our community, um, there's the big wave, right? It's coming, it's come. And so we want to make sure that our community is prepared for that long term. Um, and not just looking at, you know, the band-aid fix, so to speak. So, and then lastly, I'll say in terms of behavioral health, we have partnered. So our efforts, we don't want to just keep, you know, working over here. We want to make sure the left hand and the right hand know what's going on. So we did, um, during COVID, we partnered with Polk Vision. Um, and the county, we have basically uh, collaborated to roll out the strategic behavioral health um, assessment. And from that is what we've used to be able to advocate for state, federal funds, policy, you name it. But it's also helped us to be able to align our efforts and try to break down some of the silos that exist unintentionally. Um, and so we're seeing a lot happen on that front and there's a lot more. But um, those are some of the things that we could do. Again, not direct service providers, but just trying to be in a position to support our local healthcare system is extremely important because that's the intent of the sales tax. Thank you, Joy. Well, as Jason mentioned, we've really benefited from Watsi Clinic bringing in experts, they're practicing locally, and after COVID, we've really changed our, you know, really emphasized our focus on the patient experience. Not having to travel far to get, to get the care, it's right here locally. So some of the things I'll mention are new bariatric program. So this has been uh, where uh, weight loss managed through medical means or surgical means uh, has been a, a, a new program for us. Also, inpatient rehabilitation. When you think about uh, having to have extra help to get back after a trauma or, or, or a crash or, or something like that, you have inside our facility at Lakeland Regional a, a full rehabilitation facility at the Banish Institute, so that's been a big plus. One thing that had really concerned us over the years had been uh, mothers giving birth to babies that need intensive care, so the neonatal intensive care unit, bringing that to a level three, which is one of the higher levels of neonatal intensive care right there in our facility, because many years ago, patients had to go to Orlando. <coughs> so that's been a, a big benefit. 
Uh, we've just uh, put online a heart-lung machine. So heart-lung machines, uh, those are take over the active uh, uh, work of the heart and lung when we can't support it with other means. Those patients and families would have to leave the city to go to Tampa, Orlando if they needed that intensive services. Now we have a very successful program right here in, in Lakeland. Um, by the way, uh, you know, heart lung machines is also when you have heart bypass surgery. You know, you can't operate on a beating heart. And, and if you remember, you know, kids sometimes have born with a hole in the heart. The first operation, you may ask yourself, what was the first heart lung machine? It was dad. Dad was hooked up to the little baby so they could stop the heart very briefly, fix it, and they used the oxygen and blood from the father. So very interesting history to it. But now when someone has severe infections of the lungs, severe damage to the heart, you know, we, we now have this uh, heart lung machines that are now taking care of the most critical patients so they can stay locally. Um, we've also, um, you know, really started to open many more of our primary care offices. We have almost a dozen uh, or so primary care offices and even new to be uh, already functioning urgent cares uh, and more things on, on the line down the road. Uh, my personal interest is, is, is on that transition of care from the hospital to the different places in the community. One is skilled nursing facilities. So I, I joined Dr. Zaidi, who's a geriatrician, um, at um, Florida Presbyterian Homes. So I'm the medical director of Florida Presbyterian Homes. And that's really, uh, I feel honored to be able to be there and see the processes of how we're taking care of people throughout stages of recovery. And uh, that, that's soon to be called a Westminster, is the you may hear that name also. And then lastly, um, research. Uh, we're really trying to be on the cutting edge of developing the answers to certain medical questions and involving uh, the community in that. So our residents have these wonderful ideas of understanding things better, trying what is the best way to care for folks. And, and I, I, I have the honor of being involved in that too. So I, I think Lakeland Regional has added a number of services, but um, yeah, the list could go on also. And we have some certainly exciting plans down the road. All right, last question for the moderated portion of the panel. Um, this might be my favorite question. So rapid fire, give me your number one tip for Polk County's residents to successfully navigate through the healthcare system to get the care that they need. Jason. Well, my theme, I guess, is, is that when it's done right, healthcare is a relationship between the patient and, and, and the provider. And regardless of where you have your healthcare delivered, in that relationship, like any relationship, it takes two. And so the, the, the number one tip is to be a part of that relationship, be involved with that relationship, ask those questions, um, you know, and, and, and really help steer your own, your, be, be an advocate for yourself. I mean, there obviously is a great need for patient advocates to go through some of the uh, other bureaucratic red tape that we're all forced to deal with. But, once you get into that relationship with the provider, be an active participant in it. Awesome. Dr. Hay, you look ready. So to go in deeper with that, having to become that advocate, is you're engaged in your patient portal and you're helping your grandparents and, and, and with their permission, getting, getting them engaged in that information. So the questions, I would say the number one tip is a very important group of questions that's supported um, by the National Institute for Healthcare Improvement is to say, these are the three questions when you're inter in interacting with your doctor. The first one was, uh, what is my main problem? A lot of patients, you can ask them that after their doctor. Do this, ask your parents, ask your spouse, what's the main problem? They should be able to have that answer. What do I need to do about it is the second question. And the third is, why is this important to me? That is a starts the fundamental and it's it's not going to stop there. It's going to be where you're going to be really engaged in your health care and understand them. So d don't hesitate to do it, as Jason said, ask those questions and make sure you're satisfied with the answers. If not, go elsewhere. Make sure you get your answers uh, that you wanted. Make sure you have time to ask your questions because you want that doctor to be able to sit down with you, that nurse, that uh, physician assistant, or that nurse practitioner to really get to know you and to be able to answer your questions. So that, that I think is the main tip. Get your, get your uh, questions answered. Thank you.
So I agree with everything that's been said and would, would add to. So just one of the things that I'll say Central Florida Healthcare is trying to do, we have a call center that's staffed with about 25 um, call center employees that are trained to help educate. So we get about 3,000 phone calls a day. And so that call center um, is responsible for helping to navigate those those uh, patients that are calling in to get the resources and to you know to just help them find um, the resources for whatever care that they need. But I think too, um, you know, for as far as the question, the number one tip, I wish um, that we could see more people being uh, proactive in preventative health care. I think that is key to. Um, you know, what we are all trying to do is really be able to work with those individuals and those families, have a patient-centered medical home so um, we can catch a lot of the things early on um, is very important. But again, that's educating the community to um, the residents to do that. Thank you. Joe, do you have anything to add? Well, I think you said. <laughs> um, but I, I would say uh, definitely <coughs> don't give up. You definitely you've got to be your own advocate. That really was what I was going to say. But when it gets difficult, don't just stop because more than likely there's many other people out there going through the same frustrating <laughs> thing that you're going through or someone that you may know may be going through. And you may need to offer some help or point them in the right direction or um, you yourself may need to continue to pursue it because we've got to help people if everyone throws in the towel and when you need care, then by the time you get the care, it's going to be more costly, more complex, right? So um, in that note, definitely following up on what was said, don't wait. Get the preventive checkups. You make time for yourself because you can prevent something more serious from um, occurring or getting um, more, uh, I guess, uh, threatening to your health by doing that. So definitely engage and look out for yourself. Do you have one more comment? Uh, yeah, just to speak on that prevention, if you know a relative that has some diabetes and they're not following up with it, if something unexpected were to occur, like uh, the gallbladder decides to act up and they need an operation, or God forbid there's a car crash and they have to have surgery, you'd much rather be a well-controlled diabetic who got preventative health care than an out-of-control diabetic going through surgeries and getting all sorts of treatments while your sugars are, are already causing some problems. So that prevention really means a lot. Okay, great. Look at that, 7.25, it's amazing. So we're going to turn our attention to audience questions. And as uh, Trinity, and uh, maybe she's on her own doing it, sets up, um, I have a question from out in the internet world to ask while she sets up and you guys prepare what you have to ask. Um, so this, I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Haight. Um, a reader has concerns about <coughs> measles in Polk County. Um, as of March 25th, there were 11 reported cases in Florida. Uh, and how, how is Polk County being impacted and what advice do you have for parents regarding, regarding vaccinations? Well, measles is a highly contagious disease. We've had one case in a person over the age of 20, which is actually is a little more severe in those over 20 and those who are very young. Um, there can be some complications. And if the numbers were to go up, as we're seeing in other parts of the world and other parts of the United States, eventually there will be some of these complications where really bad lung infections can occur from measles and brain infections can occur. So uh, it is a disease to take seriously. Also for the other reasons, it's very contagious, especially if you're unvaccinated. So one case only in Polk County, we're sort of getting near the end of that period where we really are worried about the second, third, or the others. But um, uh, we're seeing it in other parts of the country and everything is just an airplane trip away. So with it, we're raising awareness in both our emergency departments and our clinics, what to look out for. We're, we're really raising the awareness to get vaccinated. You know, that, that is a very, very effective vaccine. vaccine. And if, not, if you haven't ever been vaccinated, there's a catch-up process also. So, uh, and the odd thing about the disease is that it presents uh, not with a illness and rash, it's an illness of runny nose, red eyes, a cough, and little spots in the mouth, and then after a few days, the rash hits. So sometimes we can hear the story very carefully, and somebody tells us, oh, my child got, you know, a fever and a rash within a few hours of them. No, that's not easy. 
you know, and now if it's the other story, we're very concerned. You always want to call ahead. You just don't want to show up in a crowded waiting room and say, hey, here I am with my measles. Um, call ahead. There's ways we can reduce the spread of that. So get back to you. And we're, we're certainly alerting others uh, in our emergency departments on how to recognize the case, how to take steps to protect that person, protect others, and provide the care necessary. Great. Thank you. Are you ready for questions or do you want me to? Okay, so we've had quite a few submitted from the group that's present here. I also want to say if you have, if you have questions, um, we can come around and grab them from you, or you are welcome to come up and ask them yourself with the mic. It's whatever you are comfortable with. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the ones that have actually been submitted from our audience here. The first one uh, is about the Live Healthy Initiative. There was a lot of discussion about this at the legislative wrap-up this week. And they asked, how will this support challenges of the health climate here in Polk County, especially serving those less fortunate? Any thoughts? In terms of how that legislation is going to help our community? Yes. Um, so it, there's a lot involved in that legislation. In fact, um, a lot of the things that we all here echo today, and that is workforce pipeline. Um, if you don't have the resources to provide the care, then you can't get the care. Um, so we're excited to see the benefits of that coming out because we definitely want to continue to get people connected. Um, we have mechanisms in place that are there to do that, but it won't work if we don't have the, the medical um, resources. And that's just a few of the things. Um, but I, I think that our colleagues here, my colleagues will have a whole lot more to add to that as well. But we were, we've had many of those conversations um, with Senator Burton, and we were happy to see that um, get passed. We were there, so uh, a good uh, feather in the cap for the state of Florida. So I will just add um, kudos to Senator Colleen Burton for her efforts with this. We were up in Tallahassee um, visiting with her, um, all the federally qualified health centers. And I think from, uh, or for us, it will help with um, workforce and it will help with some of the um, graduate medical um, programs that come through. So I think um, for, for, and maybe for all of us too, it'll help with um, access to, um, to being able to get um, residents and hopefully stay in Polk County, and then also with workforce issues. So there's a lot to it, as Joy said. So as it unravels and we learn more, I think it'll, it'll definitely be a very good thing for Polk County. And can I ask the follow-up? When do you expect to see the impact from this legislation? We, know we don't know yet. That's a good question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the next question, and I think this one is going to be for Dr. Haight and Jason, says, the relationship between LRH and Watson Clinic has not always been as cooperative as it is today. What areas do both institutions see the need for improvement, and where do they now excel? Don't jump in. Oh, I didn't so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, certainly um, moving forward, you know, having having the, the, the partnership and having, for for example, the, the hospitalists. These are trained uh, experts in focusing on the care of the patient in the hospital. And we benefit from uh, hospitalists from Watson Clinton being at our facility and really being that physician that coordinates the care. In fact, even uh, some of them uh, have gone through training on a compassionate care workshop that we've been running. They've been involved in many committees. Um, you know, I think of, uh, of, of Dr. Mines and, and the group of cardiologists. Uh, there is a national standard that if you're having a heart attack, and that little blood vessels that feed your heart oxygen are blocked. How long does it take to get that blocked artery opened up? And the national standard is 90 minutes. But thanks to the group of physicians that we have at Lake and Regional and Watson Clinic, uh, we, we, on most months, as below 60 minutes from the time they enter the door to the time that artery is opened up and the heart muscle is no longer dying, it's actually now it's starting to get into that recovery phase. So those, those uh, options, uh, you know, help help incredibly. What I see room for improvement, which is ongoing, is we're really tying together the communication. <clears throat> it's becoming easier to communicate and being able to coordinate care. So if a patient comes in with multiple system problems, lung, you know, gastric problems, uh, blood problems, uh, the doctor hospitalist is, is, is working to communicate better so that, that care is coordinated because that patient sees a team caring for them. 
And if that patient does leave the room, the nurse knows how to really keep that care going and connect with the doctors that are caring for that patient, which might be very complicated. So I see that communication improving. It used to be difficult to get medical records from outside the hospital, but now we see the connection where medical records are securely shared um, so that we can see what was happening in the clinic. What were the diagnoses? We can go to the pharmacy and get the medications. That's huge. There's more work to be done, but I think that's the exciting part. I guess I have the benefit of being recent, right? So I, I don't I don't have the history about the way it used to be, but you know, I meet with uh, LRH leadership routinely, and and I say this to them: we, we have a, a great coopetition, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that obviously there are things on the outpatient side that we compete, and that's great. That's great for our patients. That's great for our community. I love competition. It makes me better. It makes our facility better. Um, but there's a whole lot that we cooperate with, right? I mean, they are where the pre preponderance of our work is done from our specialists. Uh, we have a lot of relationships uh, with them where, you know, the service line is only Watson Clinic uh, providers. And, and that's, a, that's a huge benefit um, to the community and, and Lakeland Regional uh, embraces that and makes sure that, you know, we work together. We have medical directorships, we have co-management agreements like in cardiology that were discussed, and it's all about making sure the continuity and the continuum of care from the outpatient setting into the inpatient and then back out into the outpatient setting is as smooth as possible. Um, so I, I find my relationship and um, how we work together to be very, very enjoyable. And, um, you know, I, I work very well with uh, Daniel Drummond, Patrick in the back. Um, you know, I need him to work on his golf game, but other than that, <laughs> he and I get along great. And, and we have a lot of things that, that we collaborate with. We have a lot of things that they have a strategy and we have a strategy, and that's okay because at the end of the day, uh, it's all meant to be better for our patients. I have a follow up from an outside reader that had a question that I think you mostly answered. Um, but their question was a very personal situation where the communication did not occur. Um, but I would like to just add that part of that is we've all got to advocate for ourselves in those situations as patients, like we are from the number one tips for navigating healthcare. Um, so if something's not happening to your life and communication isn't happening, I think these guys up here would be open to hearing that and communicating better. Okay. And for communicating better, can you guys hear me? In the back? Okay, thank you. I think I've got to take my own advice on eating the microphone. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hay, did you have something you wanted to add? I, was that a question? It was just a comment, just uh, to tie in another I person. think we're all emerging out of COVID, and what we've seen is our patient satisfaction increasing, so that, that's been a big plus, but we're putting a lot of emphasis behind it. That every Friday, uh, Daniel Drummond, our, our leader, shares with us the, the positive comments that are coming from our patients, but anytime there's an issue, we want to get to the details, we want to get to the bottom of it, so we can solve those problems, and it is that, you know, increasing that communication and not hearing about something that was three weeks ago or, or, or last year, but we want to know, you know, what can we do that makes things better? Well, Dr. Hayes, I'm going to keep you on the hot seat for a minute because our next audience question is about LRH, and I'm going to ask you to educate me on something that's embedded in this question. It asks, why did LRH move to a hospitalist model of care, and is that really better for the patient and their family? And my question is, what is a hospitalist model <laughs> of care? So, um, I, yeah, so I, the main focus there was if you go back to the past, there were doctor's offices and you'd have your doctor. They would be in, in the clinic. You would visit them in the clinic and they would manage your chronic medical conditions or deal with something that new that came up. You had stomach pains, they would order the tests in the clinic. If, uh, if you had diabetes, they would treat it. If you have blood pressure, they'd treat it in the clinic. If your patient, uh, develop something where they needed to be hospitalized. They would have maybe gone to the emergency room. The emergency room would have called that doctor and said, your patient's here in the emergency room. We're admitting them to the hospital. That doctor, after the clinic, which could have been from 7 in the morning till 5 in the evening, then goes to the hospital and sees all the patients that they had in the hospital. Then the next morning, they would go at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., see all their patients that were in the hospital and then go to their clinic. Now that's the past. 
the problems that developed, it was, well, what happened while the doctor was in clinic between 8 and 5? You know, paying attention to their patients. And, and it was hard to really uh, get, get the care in the hospital done, where you think that is the one of the more important times, is when you're in the hospital, if your doctor is tied up in clinic, because they're doing something just as important. What if you're sitting down with a patient and you're delivering news about a test result or they're suicidal or what have you? That doctor's tied up in clinic. So to solve that problem, they developed a nationwide, and if not worldwide, hospitalists that are physicians that are full-time inside the hospital. Now, the part that I think we still want to work on and improve upon is when that patient arrives, the doctor is told in the clinic, your patient's in the hospital, the hospitalist will be caring for them and communicating back. There's a lot of things that it have needed to improve about getting the records back and forth because that patient, when they leave the hospital, the doctor back in the clinic, who stayed now in the clinic, needs to understand what was going on to their, with their patient inside the hospital. So sharing that information has become a bit easier. But that's the general concept of a hospitalist. They stay inside the hospital um, uh, all day, um, and there's the rotate at night, and then they'll do this for a week or two, and then switch off, and then someone else stays in the hospital. So if that's that's my um, that's how I would explain it, um, and certainly that brings up issues of the the hospitalist now can help coordinate the lung doctor, the stomach doctor, uh, the neurologist that may need to also see that patient for whatever reason they're inside the hospital. So the, the system has benefits and it has drawbacks. And I think, judging from the question, you know, why can't we go back to the old way of doing it? Well, there is drawbacks to the old way. You couldn't get a hold of the doctors. They were tied up in clinic. And they would, you know, burn out. You would burn out the doctor who was in clinic all day and then went to the hospital from 6 to 9 at night and then came back in the morning. So there were pros and cons to that. That was my history 101. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So the next question I have for, um, from someone in the audience here is something that I think we all, as lay people not in the medical field, feel. And um, I don't know if you can answer this, but if you can just provide sort of some insight and context. Uh, this person says, I've experienced my doctor saying insurance companies dictate my care. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you know, that, that, that goes back to the red tape, right? I mean, that, that really is, you know, um, there are, you know, step therapies that physicians have to, to go through when they know the answer that they're trying to get to, which just increases the cost, increases the overutilization, uh, because the insurance company says you have to. Um, I mean, it boggles my mind when I have a physician that says, hey, I think this patient should have X. And then the insurance company says, no. And then there's an escalation process that takes days. And at the end of the day, the final escalation is having the insurance doctor talk to the doctor who said they needed it and say, well, why do you think you need it? <clears throat> because damn it, it's my patient, and that's what I think. And so there then are times that that doctor says no. Um, but it's more times than not when it escalates to that particular point, uh, the, the physician is able to convince the other medical professional as to why the patient needs it. But it's a, a, a utter waste of time. It's an utter waste of resources. Um, if you think answering the phones at Watson's back, try a Blue Cross Blue Shield, right? Uh, and, and, and trying to take a physician out of clinic to be on hold for an hour for the medical review guy to get on to them him to argue, this is what I'm trying to do for my patient. So, um, dictate the care? No, okay, I, I will rephrase my answer. But, but definitely influence and try to maneuver, and, and yeah, they, it, it, it does. Uh, it, it happens. I think the more Lakeland becomes an academic medical center, and, and, and have the academics there, it's evidence-based, it's been proven. And when you do get to that, that frustrating phone call, it becomes quite simple when, when the physician that's advocating for their patient 
knows the medicine, knows the science, and is able to say, we go, we did this, and then we do this, and I'm asking, why am I even asking permission to do this? This is the next step for the patient's best interest. And granted, there are times where somebody may order a test where, or order a treatment where pretty much the evidence says that there's more effective, less costly medications, and yeah, they, get, they got a point there, but that's where it falls apart, where before you get to that phone call, the physician sort of realizes, you know, I really, I really get to get back to my patient and say, you know, I know you've heard about this on television, but actually the first step is to do this. I'll, I'll say, um, what's the commercial we're seeing all the time? Sleep apnea, implanting whatever that device is here. Yeah, that that's works really well, but it's for people who's failed the, the CPAP mask. And of course they show all the frustrations, but I have a CPAP mask and it's not that bad. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I want to know that if this were to fail me, I could go to that step that I see on television. But if I just wanted to go to that step first, hey, there's risk of that thing getting infected, there's complications with the surgery, and I could understand if that was set, if I was sat down and explained, why don't we try this? And if I show you that, I can't wear this mask, it's, 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 it's worsening my condition, then getting that implanted device that helps with your sleep apnea can, can be it. So that, that's why I see there's, there's two sides to it, but yes, it is very frustrating, and we have to be really prepared and ready to go battle to advocate for our patient. Thank you for your very honest answer, <laughs> even if it doesn't satisfy, but it's honest. Um, all right, the next question I have, and I think I have two more from our audience members, but I think we have a few more from the readers. Um, is again it's directed to you, Dr. H. Uh, where is mental health first aid offered? I think several of you can answer this question. Yeah, that, I know the school board had it, but like the regional, I believe, was pulling it together also. Um, I think East River Center. East River Center, thank you. I the Florida Chamber actually also has a training coming up on April 12th. Yes, and uh, I've, uh, you know, there's the adolescent version and there's the adult version. <laughs> And again, if, if, you, if you're around people and you're an observant person, uh, that, that course really gives you the ability to not pretend to be a psychiatrist, but to be someone who's helpful. And, and then part of that issue, which frustrated me with the mental health first day, is that once you start helping a person, where do you go, how, where do you go? Now we're starting to answer that question. We have more resources in the community. Tri-County, Peach River, Watson Clinic, uh, Central Florida Healthcare, or Lakeland Regional. You know, mental health, behavioral health is, is really taking its role as where it's integrated in the overall health of the person. And there's one at Bonnet Springs, too. Yeah, and, and Bonnet Springs. Mm -hmm. What? It, it, this mental health. There's going to be a mental, uh, mental health first aid class offered at Bonnet Springs. I don't have the date or time, but I just got that information a few weeks ago. Do you know who's, who's been there? Can we do a link? I would be glad to send that follow-up information to Alice so she can share it, but it's, they're all over the county, but that was just recent um, in addition to Peace River, and then there's a, a managing entity um, that they all work with that also provides the courses as well, so um, I'll be sure to share our access to you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so the last question I have currently from our audience is, what are our options to expand Medicaid, and does any hospital lob lobby to expand it? Options for Medicaid expansion. I, th I think it's very important we learn more that, that generally people learn more about it, what it provides, um, and that it can it can help people answer that question: How, how am I going to maintain my health care and have the costs covered? Um, I'm not an expert in it, but but I think Medicaid expansion has, has been occurring in more and more states around the United States. And it is being considered in Florida. That, that's my awareness of it. But I think there's probably other folks, even in the audience, who probably can answer that question better. But Medicaid expansion, I think, is is something that uh, uh, I think would be beneficial. Did you have a question? Oh, I do. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I just, I just came down. <laughs> the last yes. one. So actually, the the question before was another of my questions, but I wasn't. Uh, going to ask that one, but in fact, Florida is one of only 10 states that has not taken the Medicaid expansion, which is part of the Affordable Care Act. 
Yes, and I, I had read where they're looking at it, whether it's going to happen this legislative session. It's not happening. Okay, so that's, that, that, thank you for the information, because it is something we need to keep an eye on and to look at the, 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 the benefits of, of what that would be. And do. everybody, there is now a ballot initiative. I didn't come supposed to be um, advertising this, but there is a ballot initiative to get it on the ballot in 2026. So my question is, Okay, so oral health is an intricately linked to overall physical health, uh, mental well-being, and school performance. 66 of Florida's 67 counties have dental health professional shortage areas. In 2021, 120,000 Floridians visited ERs for preventable dental conditions. One solution is the introduction of a mid-level oral health provider called a dental therapist. What is being done to address dental access issues in Polk County? And would the members of the panel support the introduction of dental therapists in the state of Florida? I'll take this one, or I'll start, I'll start, I should say. So that's a great question. Um, when, I, when I started at Central Florida Healthcare, we had a couple of dentists and maybe a few dental um, clinics, and that was it. And so we actually had our dentist cleaning teeth, and I said, why, why are we doing that? Um, so we um, agreed that oral health was extremely important, and so we now have 11 dental clinics uh, staffed with dentists, hygienists, um, we have you know, dental assistants, and then we also have um, an MDI, Medical Dental Integration Program, and those are um, dental hygienists that work within the medical clinic um, with the medical providers, because so often we see patients come in, little kids, and they're three, four, five, six years old, and they've never even owned a toothbrush. And so that hygienist, you know, that warm handoff, they're able to work with the, with the parents and work with the child on oral health care. So we continue to see the great value um, of having um, oral health care, having dentists and hygienists and that team within our um, health centers. Um, we were advocates for the dental therapy. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the... Um, dental. Oh, dental. Yeah, dental therapy. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Uh, for the dental therapist. And so we were up in Tallahassee um, advocating for that. It did pass. Um, it went further this time than it has in the past, um, which is great. Uh, I think there's a lot of conversation and a lot of misunderstanding from perhaps the private dental world um, on what that person's going to do. So um, I know I'll just say as a community health center, we're going to continue to advocate for that dental therapist and that um, program because it just adds more individuals that are trained to work under the dentist to um, help see more patients because there is a shortage we have um, you know for the last two years have been short a uh, pediatric dentist finally found someone out of state um, so we're proud that we're fully staffed in all of our dental clinics but it is a challenge um, for dental for sure it, it was when I started as the health department director in 96, of all the health departments, the Polk County Health Department was the number one provider of dentures in the state of Florida, and no children were seen. So with the help of our you know, local dentists, we switched to children's dentistry and got into prevention and dental sealants, and we got a grant from the Lake Wales Foundation, Hospital Foundation, and they provided the funding for sealants. But it's having that team present, and, and I'm on the board for Talbot House, and, and they deal a lot for, with the homeless in both mental and dental, mental, dental. And, and I think that is a key aspect because the impact that it has. And, and you may think a child loses their baby teeth. If you lose your baby teeth too soon, you will speak differently. You will become sub, sub, uh, you know, self-conscious and, and to have that happen to a little child, that's not what's supposed to happen. Those teeth are supposed to stay there a certain amount of time. And having the support that takes the load off of the, of the dentist and the hygienist, um, I, I'd be interested in seeing how that moves forward. Question? Just really quick to follow up. Um, for the county, what we do with a half cent um, sales tax funds, we do provide funding to um, some of our community providers here, including um, Lakeland Volunteers in Medicine, some of the other free clinics, 
as well as Central Florida Healthcare, the Florida Department of Health here in Polk County, and Travis Dental, um, where they have the uh, dental assisting school. And so we are infusing these dollars to serve people who are uninsured under 200% of the poverty level in Polk County residents. So um, that's where the money, some of the money is going to help on that front. Thank you. Hello, my name is Frank Howes, and you are the answer for me tonight. And I can't thank you enough for doing this. I appreciate you very much, Lakeland Vision, Lakeland Now. If you can imagine <coughs> the group that I represent, most of them are at home now in their recliners watching Jeopardy. Okay? <laughs> I represent that group that is 76 and older. And um, they are perhaps getting ready for bed now or hoping that their kids will come over and help them get ready for bed if they need help from a caregiver. They hope that they have that caregiver that can take care of them. Uh, I am fortunate that I can be a caregiver for, for my wife, and I'm blessed to be able to do that. But my experiences that I've had in situations where we have had to respond suddenly to moving from one situation to another, from the comfort of our home, and to a situation where we are uh, confused and trying to interpret what to do in, in a hospital situation is very difficult for those who are um, conflicted with uh, either a mental status or some kind of disease that, that takes them out of their environment and they're thrust into another situation. So I'm going to share with you my question. What efforts can be made to provide improved hospital care for the elderly? Older adults, older adults coming to the hospital through the ER and then are admitted can be suffering from delirium, altered mental state, as well as possible complications of dementia, Parkinson's, or other disorders that can make a stay in the hospital difficult and often very dangerous. Care is provided for pediatrics in a wonderful way at Lakeland Regional and women's care is state of the art and other specialties. The hospital appears to be lacking with geriatric care. Quiet and private room care is a must for those who need senior care. Uh, what can you share that will help us in that capacity? And I'm sure I know where that question is going. And this guy, <laughs> this guy is my idol. I love seeing him on TV because he stands for what's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you really had, oh, thank you very much. Just another question, but I'll leave it in case you have time. <laughs> Um, this is a very important, very important topic as, a, as, an, old, as an aging population, it's, it's a really critical topic. And when we, we recognize those issues, trying to recruit geriatricians, the partner I mentioned earlier, Dr. Zaidi, and his partner, Dr. Adriano, the geriatricians, and I, I'm trying to become board certified in, in uh, being a medical director here at the, uh, for post-acute care. Um, one thing I think has put us on the right road, which is very, very recent, is we just became accredited uh, for a geriatric accredited emergency department. What, this is just blows me away what's happening behind the scenes. It's going to take some time for us to see full fr fruition of it, but already we've received the accreditation because we've already gone through that training here very, very recently. And what it focuses on is, is making sure we're, we're approaching just as you described, the care of the older person, and you mentioned the three Ds, uh, the, the, the delirium from a medical, you know, medical condition can throw you into delirium, can be confused with dementia, which can be an ongoing uh, issue. And the third one is actually severe depression, which is actually more common and making sure we're aware of that. But what's happening behind the scenes is our emergency room staff is now much better trained on fall preventions, on assessing the skin, you know, the skin can just be the doorway for infections and other problems, but it can also reveal signs of injury and signs of abuse or signs of dehydration. Focusing on something as just urine output was another big issue here because you become dehydrated, that delirium and dementia will both get, get worse. There's also the issues of, of if very unique in if, if, if I fall and, and have a trauma, it's gonna be different in somebody who's 75, 80 years old. So dealing with trauma in somebody who's older. So our emergency departments need to be very familiar with that. Our radiology department, you just can't hop up on that x-ray table. You need that extra care because the skin could 
tear very easily. Older patients might be on medicines similar to steroids that cause bruising if care is not being done. So I agree, we have to raise that awareness, not just in all facilities, is that caring for somebody who's older because it's a different setting and we have to understand that transition process, that once the emergency room has done their job, how do you transition to the hospital or back home or to a skilled nursing facility temporarily so you can get stronger to go back home. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to see that, that kind of change. Um, also, I wanted to mention um, the, the important part in, in caring for our older population is what's called trauma-informed care. Uh, we do this at the, um, the uh, skilled nursing facilities because a person's past history is very important to understand. Did somebody have a traumatic event 20, 30 years ago that still affects them today? Did somebody have something happen recently that affects them today? We have to be aware of that so we don't make matters worse, so we're able to help that person. So trauma-informed care is also a big part. It doesn't occur in the emergency room, but it occurs elsewhere in healthcare, and you want to start seeing that. Um, so yeah, thank you for that, and, and I, I would like to sh you know, be able to share more as this accreditation has, has really raised awareness, plus our, uh, our residents that are in training in the emergency room, those <coughs> doctors that are in training, it's mandatory they undergo the training that got us that accreditation. Thank you, Dr. Nate. We have arrived at 8 p.m. 7.59. <laughs> there are about four questions left from the audience. Do you want me to do that? Do you want me to ask them? Can I send them to the panelists to look at? Can you post them? Um, I think actually uh, one of the questions was one of the ones that the, the previous gentlemen, actually I think two of them were the ones, oh, sorry. <laughs> so there were ones I did not know about. Um, uh, do, you know? um, <laughs> do we, can we stay another, say, five, ten minutes? Are we okay with that? Okay. Um, okay, yes, let's go ahead and ask. Okay, that. the first one has to do with um, local health care addressing the medical care of athletes at the secondary schools, like high school athletes. Are there opportunities to have sports medicine outreach with board certified and licensed athletic trainers for care and prevention of injuries, including concussions? I think that's, uh, that's something that I understand that we've, we've looked at, we kind of start, stop, and stutter, and, and, and then uh, there's been some you know, collaboration with, with, with Lakeland Regional uh, to try and identify. I mean, it's a need. We, we absolutely see it to try and figure out what's the best way to do it. Um, and so that's something that uh, I think, you know, Watson is, is aware of and trying to figure out what's the right methodology uh, for us to do that. I mean, obviously, it's, it's um, you know, it's a cost to put, you know, a, a, a somebody on the field and, and have them there the, the whole time. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that, you know, perhaps we, again, collaborate to figure out because our, our community definitely needs it for our student athletes, for sure. Great. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from a very specific question that is regarding lags in receiving lab results from our local system as compared to getting them quicker at another system. Is there, I don't know if Dr. Nate, you can talk about that and like what the challenges are with getting lab results at like the regional, or is that best served answered by someone else? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand it completely, but the, the, you know, what is available is the patient portal. Now, sometimes uh, the, the, the clinician is in the middle of reviewing the result, um, and, and it, it is something that I think is a, is a very hot topic in medicine because uh, I'll give you an example, if, if you get an x-ray of your leg and it, and it was looking for something and it was not there, but they just happened to see something else, and that's called a lytic lesion, and you Google that, well, you've got two months to live. Yeah. You know, but that's, it, sometimes it's a lytic lesion, meaning it's a cyst that um, has been there for 30 years, and it, it, it's just something there that you want to have that kind of result. But I, I think we're all really in favor of transparency. It was my blood, I want my results, and, and I want to discuss what they mean. And so that, that should be something moving forward. So if there was issues and delays, 
definitely contact your, your doctor, the hospital, about that and get the explanation because I, I've, I've seen where we've turned on faster results, um, but I'm not sure I can answer that question fully depending sure. on the details. So advocate for yourself. <laughs> That's a <the> thing, right? <laughs> Um, okay, what are ways that healthcare organizations can build trust with at-risk populations that have historically had complicated relationships with healthcare, such as minorities and women? I think discussing the, the research issue, the, the, the past uh, research that was done in, in the past is to learn from those mistakes, have the right uh, evaluations of things that ensure that things are being done ethically, being done with full informed consent, that, that, that our doctors know our patients well and, and our communities well, and, and don't come into a community and say, well, here's the problem and, and you need to fix this. No, it's listening first and asking what is the biggest concern. When we went around to local churches uh, and, and developed our congregational health network, we wanted to hear, and each church was different. Some churches uh, had, had specific issues they wanted to focus on. Three people in the last year had a stroke during the service, whereas another church was concerned about, about teens and activities that they could get involved with health-wise. So I think it is sort of listening to the community. And I, I think that the, to, to build the trust is also hire the, the team that cares for you that is similar to our population. You, we want to build trust. I think that's one of the, I'm, I'm one of the directors of the uh, health disparities course at, at USF College of Medicine, and we really focus on it. You got to listen and, and hear what's happening in the community. And, and if, if something happens, you ask yourself, Am I a part of this? Am I, do, am I contributing to this wrong? How do I fix that? I will add at our clinic, we have started asking our patients who were quote unquote non compliant what's happened to you as opposed to what's wrong with you and that has changed the conversation drastically and understanding where someone is coming from and why perhaps they're non compliant with either taking meds or showing up to appointments or what have you. Just that simple twist has changed how our patients relate to our providers and it's been quite great. You look like you're ready. <laughs> okay, last question. What role do community partnerships play in enhancing healthcare outcomes for our rapidly expanding demographic? <laughs> can you repeat that question? Uh, what are ways that healthcare organizations can build, oh, sorry, wrong one. What role do community partnerships play in enhancing healthcare outcomes for our rapidly expanding demographic? Um, they play a big role. I mean, the more that we can, you know, learn from each other, um, like um, he was mentioning earlier, competition is good, healthy, um, but at the same time, we can <coughs> get a lot more accomplished by working together. We've seen that happen, um, you know, j several times over this past year, uh, multiple organizations have come together um, on different initiatives. Um, one may provide different types of services than the other, but they're all serving the same population and sometimes uh, different organizations don't provide all of the needed services for someone. So the better coordination that can occur through communicating and putting a plan together um, by, you know, crossing those lines into the, you know, talking to others and coming to the table. I mean, it's happening. It happens behind the scenes. You heard about it happening tonight. But um, the more that happens, then it's better off for the patient because more than likely they're going to get more care, um, meaningful and hopefully less uh, costly, where we can, at least for us and the population that we try to make sure the dollars go to, but it's happening on every front. Um, so I'd say it's extremely critical to, um, you know, it takes more than one. Working together, we're going to really accomplish a lot more. Yeah, and one partnership, getting back to the earlier question, is we do have partnerships with two schools uh, in partnership with Watson Clinic to help with athletic training. And so that, that's a key thing of connecting. Um, but I think that those, those uh, different partnerships, I want to emphasize something that each one of you can be involved in, is every three years our community has to assess the entire health. It's called Community Benefits Report. It's required by the nonprofit hospitals to be involved, but we've involved with all the partners, all the clinics, Watson Clinic, others, uh, Central Florida Healthcare, 
Now, when you ask about how healthy is Polk County, it gets to them, what are we going to do about it? So the way you do that is there's just four quick things I'll mention. One is it's not just the first one, the statistics, how many heart attacks are there, how many people are living with diabetes, what's the obesity rate or smoking, or how many parks are there. In fact, they used to measure how many liquor stores are there within so many miles of area. So there's a lots of data. We can get that data. It's online, Florida charts. You just Google Florida charts. You can get any statistic you want and break it down by age. But that's not the big story. The other story is we got to understand what does the community want. And during this assessment time, that's where you can help us. We and the Department of Health organizes this. They assess the community by getting your feedback. It could be internet surveys. It could be focus groups, bringing people together to have something similar. And then it's also asking experts, like the president of the university or the college or uh, the director of EMS. So that's the second thing. We've got people's opinions on what they want, because what we want might be different than what Orlando or Tampa wants, the people living here. The third one is actually, um, do we really have all the ingredients here in Polk County to, to address our health concerns? Which ones are lacking? Like, can we respond to an emergency? Can we recognize a disease outbreak? Can we empower people to do what's necessary? We honestly bring a group together, similar to this, and we ask ourselves honestly these questions just to see where we're weak and where we're strong. And the last one is, and we've talked a little bit about this, it's called forces of change. Things that we don't have any control over, but we need to know about it if we're gonna to try to tackle a problem. You know, so medic Medicaid, um, uh, what do you call it, expansion? We're not gonna, necessarily we'll advocate for it, but we may not, we don't control that issue. Now, if it happens, that changes our environment in the healthcare world quite a bit. Well, that's a part of how we start to change outcomes. We can redirect and address a specific issue to fix it. So we do these assessments for that very reason. And repeat that question again. Just want to make sure we're, this is, I want to make sure we make the connection here. Because this, What role do community partnerships play in enhancing healthcare outcomes for our rapidly expanding demographic? That assessment brings 50, 100 people more together, and it is. And when you say you look at United Way, uh, I sit on one of their committees, and that committee is focused on are we directing funding to do things that will make a difference? So that, that is a, a key issue because you want your donations to go as far as possible. And dental was one of the issues that came up. Mental health is one of the things that came up. So uh, access to care and, and avoiding the emergency room. So, but again, I thank you for these questions. And I think it's shared with what the rest of the panel says. Without your interest and without the, the sponsors and everyone and, and, and your organization, uh, we couldn't have shared this information. So I was going to say, I think that's a wonderful place to end because this entire evening is a community partnership between Lakeland Now and Lakeland Vision trying to create more transparency in our healthcare system. So I just want to say thank you so much. I want to say thank you particularly to Alice Kaler, CEO of LBIM, who actually helped us We will keep doing this for as long as the community keeps showing up for it. So thank you all. And I think with that, we can call this one a wrap. Yep. Oh, lastly, sorry. There's always one more thing. There's always one more thing. Um, before we get to the three-year community assessment, in those programs, you should have a QR code that you can scan that will take you to a very short survey. I promise it'll only take about three minutes.